Thank you, Pastor Lucas. Good morning, friends. It is so good to see each of you here, and we want to welcome those who are watching on television or some form of social media, our friends that are viewing on uh, the Good News Network and AFTV and others. Uh, this is a special presentation, if you're tuning in, from our regular uh, Sabbath worship services. This is a program, a special youth program called Identity. And it's spelled with an E, E-Y-E, identity, because we are changed by beholding. And the message this morning is going to be talking about who do you think you are? We are all, to some extent, a, a result of what we look at, and there's a transformational power in that. And we are going to be talking specifically about identity. A book came out recently called A Girl With No Name. And it's about Marina Chapman, who back in 1954, she was abducted, ostensibly the abductors were going to kidnap her. She was four years old. Something went wrong with their plans. They didn't know what to do. They didn't want to kill her. So they dumped this four-year-old girl at the end of, of a jungle logging trail. She kept thinking they'd come back and she spent the loneliest night of her life, four years old, out in the jungle, woke up, tried to walk down the trail, went the wrong way, just got totally lost in a very remote part of the Colombian jungle. Fortunately, I guess there were no jaguars there. She didn't have to worry about water because it was the time of year it rained frequently, but she got very hungry and was uh, tormented by insects. Somehow she lived out there for, they estimate, four to five years. She ended up following around this troop of capuchin monkeys. And they watched her and she noticed they would sometimes drop food as they went from tree to tree and she was eating their food and watching what they ate. And pretty soon they started getting closer to her and they'd come over and they'd touch her. And after spending time kind of figuring the closer she stayed to the monkeys, the better her chances were. One of the monkeys sat down and leaned against her and she kind of felt like she was adopted. And so even climbed in the trees, so she couldn't climb like they did, but she'd climb up to try to get the food they were reaching. Four years from the age of four, five, six, seven, eight, she lived in the jungle. When the hunters found her, she lost her ability for human speech, but she got to where she understood the signals and the cries and the sounds of the monkeys. Well, as she was introduced to society, she had some very difficult experiences in the process, but ultimately she was adopted. And uh, she was taken to England. She, of course, relearned both Spanish and English, got married, had a family, and uh, lived a, a normal life. But can you imagine? It's almost like that uh, book that Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote years ago about this uh, Baby left in the jungle, raised by apes, Tarzan. Encounters his first humans after he's an adult and realizes he's not a gorilla, he's a human. Talk about an identity crisis. To spend your life for years thinking you're a monkey or a gorilla and then find out you're human. That's where we are today. Young people the world over are being told that you have evolved from monkeys and from lower forms of life, and is it any wonder that there's confusion? There's a big difference between the teaching of evolution that you came from nothing, nowhere, for no purpose, to being made by a loving, intelligent God in His image. And the devil is basically trying to hijack the identity of the world. You can look in the Bible, in the book of Matthew chapter 4. The first temptation that Satan brings to Jesus, he is trying to hide, hijack that identity. The devil says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, the temptation was not doing the miracle of making the stones into bread. The temptation was doubting his identity. Because just before Jesus went into the wilderness, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. And then the devil says, are you sure? If you're really the son of God, maybe you're not. 
This is what he did to Adam and Eve. You know, God made you less than you're supposed to be. You should really be God's, and he's keeping something from you. He's hiding your identity from you. The devil's done that all along, trying to confuse, redefine, hijack, confound people's God-given identity. So, where do you get your identity? Maybe I should take a moment. What is identity? According to Collins' dictionary, identity is the qualities, belief, personality traits, appearance, and or expressions that characterize a person or group. Beliefs that characterize a person or a group. Your beliefs have a lot to do with your identity. And identity is very important. Identity often comes from, you know, family, your job. Some people, they get their identity from uh, sports that they play or with their different gifts and skills or nicknames. And you might have a different identity, different groups as you go from place to place. I know standing here, I'm Pastor Doug. But when I play racquetball with the guys here in town, they call me Rev. <laughs> I thought that meant they, they were saying that because reverend, which we don't use that title typically, but no, they said it's because I run around like I'm all revved up. <laughs> but I had a different identity. I, know, I don't know about you, how many of you heard uh, uh, Dr. Calvin's testimony last night? That was great. I wanted him to just pause and show me a salsa dance <laughs> just for a minute. How many of you were wondering... I, couldn't you just break a move or two here? I just want to see. I'm, I, I can't visualize this. <laughs> this preacher, dentist, being a salsa dance expert. But, so some of us have different identities in different groups. But it's really important that you know what your identity is. Now, in our world today, the devil is trying to hijack our identity and change our identity. And some people are inclined to listen to the devil. There was a, a very interesting story here in California in 1974. Patty Hearst, the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, multimillionaire, the famous printer, she was kidnapped. And the kidnapped by the Symbian Lebanese group, it was this crazy militant, rebellious group of some escaped prisoners, and they were going to overturn the government. It, they had insane beliefs. And they put her in a closet, and they beat her, and they tortured her, and uh, raped her. And then they started to brainwash her and tell her why they're doing what they're doing, kept her blindfolded. And gradually, they took the blindfold off, and they said, you could be one of us. You could be one of us, or we'll kill you. She said, I'll be one of you. And she began to get so indoctrinated with them that they took her on bank robberies. One bank robbery right here in Sacramento. Seventh-day Adventist treasurer was at the bank carrying the money from Sabbath on Monday morning, and the bank robbers shot her. This group, Patty Hearst, was not on that bank robbery that day. But they were a rough group. But you see there a picture of her holding a machine gun. She was free to run, and she had joined this group. She had gone from the wealthy, educated, prestigious daughter of a famous printer into a criminal through their programming and their abuse. Why would you follow someone that's going to abuse you that way? Young people are doing it all the time. They're following their abuser. They're being transformed by what they behold, the one who's trying to destroy them. You've got to be careful about the voices that you listen to today. There's a lot of identity theft that goes on. Yeah, anyone ever had their identity stolen? You don't have to raise your hand. I have, in not a very dangerous way, but every now and then I'll hear about somebody, it's happened more than once, and they'll say, Pastor Doug, I gave to your orphanage. I said, I don't have an orphanage. <laughs> somebody took my picture offline, they created another Facebook account, they started to communicate with people and say, oh, we're desperately in need of money for my orphanage in Africa, and they sent money. In some cases, thousands of dollars. And I said, I am so sorry. Someone stole my identity. It wasn't me. By the way, for any listening, Amazing Facts will never ask you to send money to Doug Batchelor or to some other country. It'll only go to Amazing Facts. That's already a signal something's fishy. But identity theft's a big problem. 
People will take your identity and they'll borrow money and they'll get a criminal record. They'll run up a debt and it can take years to untangle it. And the devil is trying to kidnap and redefine the identity of people all the time. Now, I'm going to be very plain with you. Uh, when I grew up, I don't remember there being any chaos or confusion about a boy and a girl. I don't think there's a lot of confusion for about 5,000 years of civilization. Uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus says he made them male and female. There were not 20 options. It wasn't multiple choice. Every female has two X chromosomes. See, your gender identity is not something that's happening below the belt. It is in every chromosome of your body. You are, and if you ever have any doubts, I don't mean to be crude, but you know, after a bath or a shower, just look in the mirror and settles it. <laughs> that's it. And once you know that, then embrace it. Embrace your femininity or your masculinity. That doesn't mean you're not going to have strange feelings. You know what? We have all kinds of feelings. The devil can make us feel all kinds of things. You can feel different based on the medicine or how much sleep or how much pineapple you ate. You can feel different <laughs> about all kinds of things. And so if you're going to base your faith on your feelings, you are going to be confused. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Let me read a verse to you. If you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 9, here's what Paul says, and I think this verse settles it. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I don't know about you, friends. I want to go to the kingdom of God. The unrighteous do not get it. Do not be deceived. That means by our culture. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's sex outside of marriage, or idolaters, or adulterers, that's people violating the marriage vows, or homosexuals, or sodomites, there's no ambiguity there, or thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revelers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. People need to be saved from sin. Problem is the government now, some countries, here in California and other states, they're saying if you talk to a person about their having these, what they call gay tendencies, and say you need to go with what the Bible says, they call that conversion therapy. It is against the law. I got a problem. My Bible is all about conversion therapy. Amen. It's you must be converted. You need to be born again. Amen. And so if the government's saying you can't do that, well, I'm sorry, I got to go with God. Yes, you can. Listen to what Paul says going on. And such were some of you. They say, well, it doesn't work. I know people that were in that lifestyle, and by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, they have been transformed. They now have families, and they're productive citizens, and they're good Christians. They said they had their minds renewed. You won't hear about that. That's being downplayed and scoffed at even in some universities, even in some Christian universities. Such were some of you, meaning past tense, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. I had to look it up because I honestly get confused. I'm dyslexic, but when you start telling me LGBTQIAS2+, you lost me. And I looked it up and it said, this is an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and or questioning, intersex, asexual, two-spirit, and the countless affirmative ways in which people choose their self-identity. That's the definition. They're choosing these. You know, you don't get to choose that part of your identity. That's your gender. God made that choice when you were born. Now, there are people who have weird, weird defects, but I've told you in every chromosome, it's either XX or XY if you're a boy. You are what you are. Can you say amen? amen? Embrace it. Do not let the society confuse you on that. Otherwise, you end up like Patty Hearst listening to your kidnappers. 
And while they say this is liberating the young people, you know what's happened to young people's suicide rates in the time that they've been propagating that? The rate of suicide between 2007 and 2018 has gone up 60% between children 10 to 24. They say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're so unhappy because they're not able to express their identity in the time they've been pushing this, telling them to have hormone therapy that's wrecking their lives and surgical procedures that mutilate them. You know, my Bible says, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, a man shall not put on a woman's garment, neither shall a woman put on a man's garment, for all that do so are an abomination to the Lord. And now we've got these transvestite groups that are going to libraries and demonstrating for kids in public libraries at your expense, drag shows. The Bible says it's an abomination. We need to embrace and celebrate the differences. This is going to be, <laughs> get me arrested probably. <laughs> Some aren't going to like it. You know, God's had a problem all through biblical history with people understanding their identity. The story of the Bible is the story of God saving a nation of slaves and trying to get them to stop thinking of themselves as slaves. He said, you are to be, and you can read about this in Exodus 19.6, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And you heard in our memory verse, we are a royal priesthood. It says, we will reign as kings and priests with God. You have a high, noble calling we are not animals that have evolved. We are made in the image of God. We're going to live and reign with Christ and be ambassadors for the Almighty through the cosmos. It doesn't get any better than that. And the devil is trying to degrade humanity. The children of Israel had been saved from slavery. God takes them from being beaten and they're in the mud pits and he brings them out into the wilderness. They're free. He gives them bread from heaven and water from a rock and delivers them from their enemies. And in the midst of all that, they said, we want to go back to Egypt. They had onions there. <laughs> and you went, what? <laughs> You'd rather serve the Pharaoh than the Lord? You want to go back with your tormentor? They didn't know who they were. You need to get your identity from God Amen. and the promises of God. You've got characters in the Bible like Joseph. God gave him a vision. God said, I have a big plan for your life. Others, even your brothers, will come and bow down to you. I'm going to do something great. And he knew it was a divine vision. He couldn't even keep it to himself. Had to tell his family and his brothers, which probably wasn't a good idea. But then even after spending years as a slave, he never forgot who he was. As a prisoner, he kept living up to the noble calling. And everywhere he went, he excelled. He says, God's got a big plan for me. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to live for God. I'm not going to sacrifice, sacrifice my convictions. Potiphar's wife went after Joseph. He said, how can I sin against God? He said, God's got a big plan for me. I'm preserving myself. And did God honor his promise? Joseph knew what his identity was. He knew about the promises God had given Abraham, Isaac, and his father Jacob, and he believed it. And that was the defining influence, no matter what his brothers said. Same thing with David. <laughs> when they came to anoint the next king, David's father didn't even invite David. He thought about all his sons. He said, yeah, well, let's bring all the boys. Ah, David, he may as well stay with the sheep. He's always writing poetry and throwing rocks. God would never choose him. But when Samuel finally poured that oil on David, the Holy Spirit came on him. He did not become king right away, but he knew that God had a plan for his life. And even though he spent years, literally years, running, living in a cave, he never forgot who he was. You can't let everybody else define you, and it sometimes can be those close to you. Might be your friends trying to define you. Let God define you. God has a calling on your life. I'll tell you a little story I don't think I've ever shared. Before my father married wife number four, I went out for the wedding. And um, I told Dad, I said, Dad, I want to talk to you. He said, okay. So I had to make an appointment, go to the office, talk to my dad. 
So I went to the office, we sat down together, and I just had begun to talk to him and just said, you know, I want to get to know you better. And he thought I was there to talk him out of marrying this 26-year-old girl. He's in his 70s. I, didn't know, I knew that was a waste of time. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to talk to him about just our relationship. And he interrupted me. He said, you're a failure. Yeah, it hurt a little bit, but it didn't hurt as much as you might think, because I know my dad. He just, that's how he is. He says, you fail at everything. You don't do anything right. Well, he wanted me to work for him, and so because I wasn't, I was a failure. And so, you know, I, I kept my cool, and I said, all right, Lord, I know what your plan is for me. And I said, I'm going to follow your plan for me. And um, I didn't let that define me. I left his office. I was a little hurt, but I didn't feel like a failure. You know, I've never pastored a church that didn't grow. And my father had, oh, just under a billion dollars when he died. But I thought about it, and you know, in the 28 years almost, I've been with Amazing Facts, looking at our budget and the money we've raised for different projects and mission things. It's about $400 million that we've raised. I enjoy being a failure like that. <laughs> you know, praise God. I decided, you know, God's called me to ministry. And my father thought, what a waste. Religion's a crutch for weak people, and he's trying to define me. And I said, no, I know. The Bible says if your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. Amen. At first, David's father, his brothers, even Jesus' own family didn't understand. But he stayed true to God's calling. God has a calling for you. That's what must define you. And you may not see it right now. You may not feel it right now. But if God has called you and he's made you a promise, you need to wait. Joseph had to wait. David had to wait. But God realized it. I had to wait. I spent years after becoming a Christian selling firewood, doing mechanic work and carpentry, but I knew God had called me. I thought, how am I going to get into ministry? Didn't even have a high school diploma. But then God worked things out, got the diploma, went back to college, and he just kept opening doors you never would think would open. And he will work miracles for you. Just believe. You know, it says in Romans 4, 17, God called Abraham father of a multitude. And his neighbors would say, what's your name? Abraham, father of a multitude. And they'd look at all of his, his entourage and say, how many children do you have? None yet, but I'm optimistic. How old are you? 75. And your wife? Uh, a little younger. <laughs> father of a multitude. You know, it says here, Abram believed even God who quickens the dead and he calls those things which be not as though they were. Now you read all the letters Paul calls us saints. You look around and you go, really? Look in the mirror and you go, really? But God calls those things that be not as though they were because they will be. If you keep following the Lord, he's calling you to be holy, to be saints. God is not going to call you something you can't be. I remember hearing a story one time. Napoleon was reviewing his troops. And uh, he was a little guy. You know, they say he was like five feet one or something. And uh, he had a big horse. And while he was walking, riding down this long row of troops that were standing at attention, he was inspecting the troops. They do this in the military. And, and uh, his horse got spooked, got bit by a fly or something. He was not holding the reins, and the horse took off galloping. And the little general, Napoleon, is hanging on to the saddle, and he's, he's getting ready to get thrown off his horse. And one of the soldiers down the line jumped in front of this huge white horse, grabbed it around the neck, got drugged for a little while, but finally got a hold of the reins, brought the horse under control, got up, handed the reins back to Napoleon. Napoleon collected his wits, and he said, Thank you, Captain. Well, this was a private. He said, Captain, of what regiment? Napoleon said, my guard. Soldier walks over to the pavilion where all the officers are gathered. He said, I'd like to know where to get my new uniform and uh, my orders. And what are you talking about? He said, I'm captain. You're what? I'm captain of the guard. You're crazy. What makes you think so? He pointed at Napoleon and said, he said so. They said, yes, sir. 
the declaration of Napoleon changed everything. God is calling you his children. He's saying you are a nation of priests. You are a nation of kings. The word of God makes things happen. Amen? Yeah. The world around you is here because God said, let there be, and it happened. He calls those things as not as though they are, and it becomes real. Now, I, I need to just pause and remind you that then again, there are those who have the wrong impression. They maybe think a little too highly of themselves. And um, it's like that Pharisee that prayed, looking down on the publican and said, I thank you, Lord, I am not like other men, extortioners or thieves, or I pay tithe of what I've got and I fast twice a week. I'm glad I'm not like oh, that publican back there. The Bible tells about Paul. You can read... Uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground. Maybe he fell from a horse. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's on his way to Damascus to arrest and kill Christians. He thought, here I am working for God against the devil. He was sincere. He was sincerely wrong. He thought he was one thing, he was the other. And he said, who are you, Lord? Well, he thought he was working for the Lord. Now he realizes, I don't know him. And he said, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. Instead of working for the Lord against the devil, he found out I was working for the devil against the Lord. Talk about an identity crisis. He spent three days fasting and praying and repenting, his identity was transformed. He became one of the greatest apostles and wrote maybe a third of the New Testament. When he had an encounter with Jesus, he got a new identity. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So, oh, by the way, what's the message to the church in the last days? Revelation 3.17 you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're poor and wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. Uh, just because you're in the church doesn't mean that you have Christ's identity. There's some people that have a false idea, and in the judgment, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I don't know you. Because they think just being a member of a church is all you need to have Christ's identity. That's important, but that's not, that's not the most important thing. Where do most of us get our identity? First of all, in your family. That's probably why you've got the name you've got. You get your identity from your family. Well, you know, and I'll spend most of my time on this now, the Lord says that when you come to Jesus, like the baptism of Christ, he came out of the water and God said, this is my beloved son. You come to Christ, you surrender, you're baptized, and God says, you are now my beloved son, my beloved daughter. You are adopted into the family of God. You now receive a new identity in a number of ways. Now, let me, let me read a verse for you. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. I think you're going to see that on the screen. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption. Who might receive it? We might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, and this is including sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. It's the most intimate Papa Daddy kind of language. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God with Christ. The words of son and family and father are so intense in this passage. You are fully adopted. You became a child of God when you turn to Jesus. That gives you a whole new identity right there. <clears throat> now, what do you get when you are adopted? We're going to spend most of our time now talking about this. You get, and I've got a list here up on the screen. You get a new price, a new prosperity, a new purpose, a new personality, new power, new protection, new permanence. 
Chat BT, what is it? Can't create a sermon like that. <laughs> a few weeks ago, someone said, Doug, have you seen this new artificial intelligence? It can do sermons. He said, what's your sermon title next week? I told him. He typed in some stuff, and, and he sent me a sermon with my title. I thought, wow, I was impressed. But I told him, mine is going to be much better than that. So, my mother was a songwriter, so I like things that all rhyme, you know. A new price. There's seven points here. I could make it eight and say you get uh, new privileges, too. A new price. What happens when we're adopted? We have new value. Malachi 3.17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day when I make my jewels, and I'll spare them as a man spares his own son. 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed of men, but chosen by God and precious. What happens when we're adopted by God? We get new value. We belong to him. And we become the apple of his eye. And the redeemed on earth are the object upon which God bestows his supreme regard. We are the bride of Christ. We get a new price. Isaiah 43, verse 4, Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored. I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. He says, I'm going to value you more than anybody because we're his. We also get new prosperity. Ephesians 2, verse 7, That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Mark 10, 21, you will have treasure in heaven. The gospel is worth more than a, a man who finds treasure in a field or a merchant who finds a pearl of great price. We found the greatest riches. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? My father is rich in houses and lands. And so we get this new value, this new prosperity. And you know, when I, I became a Christian... I didn't get the mansion in Florida when I was uh, sort of disowned by my family. But um, don't misunderstand, they didn't disown me in that way, but kind of looked down upon me as uh, the black sheep. But you know what? I've got mansions all over the world. I do. Everywhere I go, people say, Doug, whenever you're here in our country, you stay with us. And boy, I tell you, I've stayed with some folks. They got really nice places. And they say, Mi casa, su casa. I say, Man, I got mansions all over the world. It's good to be a child of God. Amen? Amen. Heard about this man that um, his aunt was trying to reach him. She kept preaching to him. He wouldn't listen. And uh, when she died, she left him her Bible with a note and said, I'm giving you my Bible and all the riches it contains. You thought, well, that's sweet, her Bible, great. He went by 30 years, and he finally got so destitute, he was living kind of in a group home, and finally pulled the Bible out of a trunk and decided to flip through it and might get some encouragement. It was filled with bills of large currency, $5,000, which back when this happened was a lot of money. And it had been there all that time, and he never opened the book. He had, there's riches here. Uh, God wants you to have. A lot of people don't know about. We also get new purpose. God's got a new plan for you. Instead of being on the way to destruction, we're now on the way to delight. You know, you can read in Acts chapter 26, verse 17, what is our new purpose? Now I send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an, inherent, an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So when you become a Christian, not only are you adopted and you get a royal inheritance, we get to then share that with others and say, they got room to adopt you too. God will bring you into his family. We've got the great commission. We've got this new purpose. We've got a mission in life to seek and to save the lost. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen? And how much better is that identity? It's like when Jesus goes to Peter and after filling his net, 
Peter falls down at Jesus' feet and said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He's so amazed at this net full of stinking fish. And Jesus said, don't fear. Follow me. I will teach you how to catch men. Instead of catching fish. You know, fish don't have a lot of personality. They're not that interesting. You can catch humans. Follow me. Jeremiah 29, 13. God's got a great purpose for you. I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. You know what else you get? When you're adopted in that new identity, you get new personality. Yeah, you become a different person. The Bible calls it a new birth. You are changed. Now, a lot of families end up getting into a cycle of bad behavior because they inherit it from their parents. Some people that struggle with obesity, they say, well, it's the genes. And for years, even doctors thought, well, it must, it must be their metabolism. And what they did is then they took babies sometimes, babies that were born from a family that struggled with obesity and heart disease, and they were adopted by a family that had a different lifestyle and diet, and they did just fine. They had been reproducing the cycle of bad behavior among the children under the third and fourth generation. Parents that have problems with anger, the kids often have problems with anger. Different kinds of abuse or drug addictions are often passed on because they are demonstrated and then modeled by the kids. But when you become a Christian, you do not have to reproduce those bad patterns. You can break the cycle. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom used drugs. I don't. God, I don't, you don't have to be that. You can be a new person. You're born again. You become a new creature. Revelation 2, 17, to him who overcomes, I will give a white stone with a new name, a new person, written which no one knows. It's unique, except the one who receives it. God says, I'll give you a new heart, a new mind I'll put in you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. Those patterns and habits, you can change. Yes, you can. Both my parents and my grandparents smoked. And I started out smoking. But when I became a Christian, Jesus gave me victory. I've never had a cigarette in my mouth since the day of my baptism. He can break the chains and set you free. You get new power. You become a child of the king. Jesus says, all authority in heaven is given to me. Go ye therefore, and we go forth with royal authority from the king, as children of the king. 1 John 12, sorry, not 1 John, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave, King James says, power to become the sons of God. You get power to live a new life, power to shake off those bad habits and sins. It may not happen all at once, but God will give you power to change. He gives you power, even those that believe on his name. Philippians 4.13, I can do how many things? All things. He gives you power to do whatever he asks you to do. God will never ask you to do something without then providing the power to do it. Inherent in any command of God is the power to do what he's asking you to do. Did that make sense? It's, it's built in to his command. Any command of God has built in power when you turn to Christ to do what he's asking you to do. Joel 3.10, let the weak say, I am strong. You get new protection as a child of the king. Psalm 34.7, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him and delivers them. I know God has protected me so many times. Psalm 91, 11, for he'll give his angels charge over you to keep. That word keep there means to protect you in all your ways. And Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks to God the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of his love, in whom we have redemption. Notice it's present tense. We have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That's good news. God promises if he calls you and you follow him, he'll protect you. Nothing will come to you except what God allows. 
And you can find great peace in that. I remember in the 70s, there was a lot of organized crime in New York City and people were afraid to testify because whenever anyone testified against the mob, they got killed or their family got killed and they couldn't get witnesses. So they created something called the Witness Protection Program. And what the Witness Protection Program did is they would tell somebody, look, if you'll come out of that life of gangs or that organized crime or the mafia and you're willing to testify so we can get these people out of power, we will provide a new life for you. We'll protect you. We'll give you 24-hour protection while you're testifying. And then when the trial is over, we will give you a new name, new documentations for you and your family. We'll take you to a new town where you can start a new life with a new career and a new identity. They even have one not only federal, it's state in California. Witness Protection Program. And they even give you money to live on. And medical insurance, of course. Witness Protection Program. Well, God's got a new identity program for you. And He protects those who witness for Him. Amen? Amen. Don't be afraid to be His witness. And you get new permanence. This is one of the most important things that changes about your identity. Is now you're not living from day to day or minute to minute. Like you realize you've got eternal life. Christian gets eternal life before they die. He gives us the gift of eternal life. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now you can have the gift of eternal life. Now Christians don't die. They go to sleep. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Titus 3, 7. Having been justified by His grace, we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, when I first started gardening uh, up in the hills, I'd never grown anything in New York City. In the cave, I did grow some pot once. I have to just be, be clear about that. And that didn't even do very well. But um, someone said, well, Doug, if you want to see quick progress, plant a turnip. You'll be eating them in three weeks. And so among the other things I planted said turnip. It was so exciting because boop, they grew up. I got quick results and I could eat a turnip. But then I went up to the redwood trees and I thought, wow, someone planted that a long time ago. I said, if you're planting a redwood tree, you're thinking way ahead. Some people go through life thinking like a turnip. Short term. They got a bucket list. They say, well, before I die and it's all over, I want to do this, this, and this because that's it. Before I kick the bucket, I've got my bucket list. Now, that's okay to have a bucket list for this life, but friends, don't forget, this is not it. This is not it. The next one is it. You, we've got to not think about this, all, everything I want to do in this life as being what's really important. This life is preparation for the one that really matters, that lasts forever. God gives you permanence. You know, value also comes through durability. When something lasts longer, has more value. The Bible says, as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. Those who follow the Lord will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose fruit comes forth in its season, whose leaf does not wither. Jesus is offering us a new identity. You know how he can do that? Because Jesus traded identities with us. He took our bad identity and he gave us his good one. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He takes our wickedness and our sin, and he gives us his righteousness. He becomes the cursed sinner, taking what we deserve, and we become the beloved son and daughter. He trades identity with us. He takes the suffering. He took the suffering, the punishment you and I deserve. That ought to stir your hearts with love and gratitude. Not only how much better is it to be adopted and to have all these new things, these new positive changes in your identity. Well, how does this all happen? We are changed by beholding. We've been hearing that all week. You become like what you look at. That's why idolatry is so condemned in the Bible. It demeans the glorious God that we serve. 
I know Scott just read this a minute ago, but it bears repeating. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's like your soul is a photographic plate. And you know with a photographic plate, you, you'd move aside the plate, it would be exposed to the image and then you cover it and it captures the image. We are capturing the image of what we look at. If you're looking at the things of the world, the devil will define your identity. But if you're looking at Christ, you will become like your Lord. It's that simple. One of the most important things you can do, practical things you can do, that's going to affect you eternally is guard the avenues of your soul, young people. Be very careful what you look at. You need to pray for the Holy Spirit. I, you know, we're not asking you to throw away your phones and put your head in the sand. You've got to learn how to live godly in a wicked world. And you think, boy, it's all around us. The grace of God abounds where sin abounds. He'll give you extra grace. But if you're looking at something and you say, I don't think Jesus would look at this, then change it. If you're reading something, if you're talking about something, listening to some music, and you say, I don't know that Jesus likes this. I have to do that all day long. All of us do. That's what it means to be a Christian. You're striving for purity of heart because blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. You know, there was a, um, a wicked tax collector named Zacchaeus and he wanted to see Jesus. And there was a problem. You know what the problem was? I heard everyone say short. That was not the problem. <laughs> the problem was the crowd was too tall. There would have been no problem if there was no crowd, amen? <laughs> crowd got in the way. So he had to get above the crowd. He went and climbed a tree so he could see Jesus. How do we see Jesus? We climb a tree. We take up our cross and we follow him. And the Bible says that he saw the Lord and the Lord said, today I must eat at your house. Come to me, come down to me. And the crowd began to say, Jesus, don't you know what his identity is? He, is? he is a publican. He's the chief of the publicans. He's like mafiosa. You're going to go to his house? And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house because he is a child of Abraham. When Zacchaeus came to Jesus, he got a new identity. By the way, you know what the word Zacchaeus means? Pure. He climbed a tree and he saw Jesus. He became pure in heart. Well, friends, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Christ said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all the world to me. That means we keep Christ up there. He, Jesus said, as Moses, John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, they looked and they lived. They were dying from the venom of the serpent, but they looked and they lived. We've got to stop looking at the snake and start looking at the Savior. Amen? Don't let the culture define you. Let Christ define you. Amen. They looked and they lived. I want to ask before we sing our closing song. We don't have room for the typical appeal where you might come down front. But if there are some young people today and the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you this uh, week together, and you realize you've been distracted by the things of the world, but you want to turn your eyes to Jesus. You want to ask God for grace. You would like to say, Lord, I want to seek first your kingdom. I want that new identity that Jesus is providing. And you want us to have special prayer for you. Would you be willing to stand right now? Don't worry about the people that might be here. If God's speaking to your heart, and you say, I need God's grace to be able to prioritize seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Very simply, we're asking you, if you've not made that decision to make it, or if you've drifted from it, to make it now. You're wondering what a good day would be to give it all to Jesus? Now's a good time. Amen. Christ, whenever he called people, he said, now. Today, if you hear his voice. Any other young people, you might be feeling a struggle inside. That's between your, your Savior and your serpent. And you decide. You want to stand and say, I want to surrender my life fully to Jesus now. Stand. Praise the Lord. Those who are standing, we've got ushers that are going to come down. They're going to give you a card. We just want to know how to pray for you and be able to follow up. They're going to bring those cards to you now. 
and you can fill it out as we sing our closing song and there's others that may be struggling those were the cards come quickly and um, well, you'll, they'll give you the cards you know the Bible tells us that all things are possible with God we can be born again we can be new creatures don't worry about how you're gonna live the Christian life tomorrow you come to him today you put your eyes on Jesus and you can be transformed. How many of you want to say, I want to be more like Christ? Amen? Amen. All right, tell you what, we're going to sing the first verse of this song. Everyone who's standing, stay standing. Those sitting, stay sitting. I'll tell you when everyone can stand because I want the ushers to find those that are standing and get the cards then. We're going to sing first verse of this song, Be Like Jesus. Verse 2 now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for your presence here today. Thank you that you're offering each of us a new identity. Lord, I pray that you be with those who have stood and decided to either return to you or come to you for the first time. And I pray that you'll seal that decision by baptizing them with the Holy Spirit right now, Lord. Help them know they can come to you and turn to you. And through looking to Jesus, they can be transformed. Give them that new power, that new heart, that new joy. And I pray you'll be with each person here, and those that are watching, that they might experience that new identity that comes by being a Christian in a wicked world. Bless us now through the remainder of this time together during our youth conference. Pour out your spirit on the various speakers and our fellowship together. And I pray that you can just uh, transform us, Lord, and fill our hearts with love for you and love for each other we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you could please be seated. Just a moment. We have a few announcements we need to bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, uh, you might be wondering, well, when's the offering going to be collected? Uh, we didn't collect the offering during our service today, but we do have some of the deacons, and they're standing in the foyer. You'll see them there, and if you'd like to help contribute to the offering of the church, the funds will go towards our next uh, program that we do like this, our next summit. So we thank you for your faithfulness in supporting this work. Also, the uh, potluck is going to begin in just a few moments, and I needed to give you some direction as it relates to that. Uh, the line is going to be forming down the hallway over here to my left. 
and you'll be going in that uh, door that's on the far side of the fellowship hall. That'll be your entry point, and they'll kind of guide you around as to how you need to go. If you're not staying for the uh, fellowship lunch, you can just exit directly out of the main doors in the front, and make sure you're back at 2 o'clock. That's when our program will continue. Very important presentation at 2. We're going to have another presentation at 3, and then the question and answer program will be at 4 o'clock. So plan to be back here at 2. I'd like to have a word of prayer for our lunch, for those of you who are staying, and then we'll dismiss you. Dear Father in heaven, we have indeed been blessed by the study of your word, and Lord, we want to be able to grow spiritually ever more and more like you. Thank you, Father, for your word, the living bread. But also, Lord, we are grateful for the food that has been provided, and we ask that you'd bless the many hands that have prepared it, and we just thank you for providing for all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen.